Hey everybody, Mark Ahrensberg here with The Pure Now Show. This is episode number five. On today's show, we have William Chan. He is an award-winning film director and creative director, founder of Tomorrow, a design agency based in Singapore. Had a really great chat with William, and here it is. William Chan, thank you so much for coming on The Pure Now Show. Really appreciate your time. No, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, yeah, it's our honor. And, you know, we've been following you for a while. We are very aware of your work. You have just a huge client list, uh, award-winning motion graphics and film, and all kinds of design and creative work. And because of your wealth of experience and notoriety, we wanted to get you on the show and find out how this all began and what was your creative journey, how you ended up where you are today. Well, I, I started off, like, uh, maybe I go way back. Well, as a kid, uh, when I'm in school, I, I sort of uh, I'm very into the popular culture, pop music, films, and all those things. So back in school, art is probably my favorite subject. So I spend most of my time drawing like bands logo on on textbooks and, and t-shirts and all that stuff. So after my secondary school, I went into art college because that it was the only subject I managed to get a, a good mark. So uh, once I got into my studies in art college, I was given a chance to choose between doing like design or fine arts. And I realized that I'm not really that good in drawing. So I ended up choosing design because I, I, I really wanted to get into the industry of doing like album covers, doing like music videos and all those things I see on TV. So this is actually how I started as a kid. So uh, I went into this school called LaSalle in Singapore, studied graphic design graduated and I practiced as a graphic designer for a while. So by accident, a friend of mine actually uh, gave a number to one of the producers at MTV. I think he gave the wrong number. He, gave, he, gave, he gave, instead gave my number. And I got a call from MTV and asked if I want to do a freelance job for them. I, I straight away jumped into the, the opportunity because uh, even though I, I don't have much experience, in fact, I don't know anything about broadcast design. I didn't know how to do graphic design. So I say yes. And that uh, two weeks gig in MTV lasted for about, I think, five years. So uh, that's how I started doing motion graphics, yeah. And you were inspired, meaning, you know, yeah. you're, you're a young person, you're watching MTV, your popular culture is exploding, and then you're a part of that. Yeah, I think uh, when I started, it was the MTV came to, I think, or rather cable TV came to Singapore somewhere in the early 90s or the mid 90s. And uh, the first thing we wanted to watch was uh, an MTV. And the funny thing about it in Singapore is uh, when cable TV was introduced in the 90s, only certain part of Singapore have cable TV. Where I live doesn't have MTV. I have to travel all the way to my friend's house just to watch MTV, which is kind of weird to, to, to talk about. You, know, you go to a friend's house just to watch TV. And uh, obviously, because of the kind of content and the kind of uh, stuff that MTV is showing up, so I'm actually very uh, excited about it. And I thought of, I really wanted to do something with that. Yeah, but I just didn't know how to get into the sort of the broadcast industry because I have no idea how all those things work. But you received an invitation. You were handed that opportunity that, that turned into your career, essentially. Yeah, yes. I mean, like, uh, like I said, I, I just received a call from a producer. I kind of know that producer. Uh, it's sort of like a backstory. I, I used to be in a band and the guy that called me was the, actually the, uh, the director of a music video that I was in with my band. So for some reason, he, he, he asked for a number for somebody to work on this project, a broadcast designer, and somebody gave him my number instead. So I just took the opportunity, I just jumped right in. Yeah. So you were there five years, obviously absorbed a lot, gave you all kinds of opportunities to stretch yourself creatively, learn about things that uh, you never would have probably been exposed to had that opportunity not presented itself. Uh, how did you leverage that going forward for the rest of your creative career? Well, uh, like I mentioned, I think I always felt that uh, back then, uh, the broadcast industry is, is something that's very hard to penetrate. Uh, I think it's because uh, unlike nowadays where there's a software, you can actually do produce work or even do a lot of different kind of uh, production at home on your laptop. But back then, when I started in MTV, they're, they're still using uh, uh, edit suites to make graphics, which is kind of strange. And they're using like machine like Hell Machine. So it, it, it's not something that I could actually have the oppo opportunity to do it at home. Because uh, even though that, I think After Effects just came out when I started in MTV. But 
it's still not something that I had a chance to understand how the broadcast industry works. So working in MTV uh, gave me that perspective of how actually uh, even the, the, the function, the workflow of how a broadcast uh, industry or in, in the sense motion graphics uh, actually works. So uh, that experience for five years in MTV sort of gave me the confidence, I suppose, to actually go out there and do work for different uh, clients. So when you finished your five-year stint with MTV, did you go freelance or did you go into another full-time situation? Well, the funny part is uh, after I left MTV, I, I started freelancing actually. But for another four to five years, almost exclusively, I'm still doing MTV. That, that, that's the funny thing. And I really do enjoy doing that work simply because uh, how creative I can actually explore through the brief of MTV. Uh, I did a little bit of work for different channels, but obviously uh, different channels have uh, a very strict sort of uh, 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 visual or corporate guideline where the system works needs to visually explore in certain ways. So like I said, for the first four or five years after, I, I just do MTV. And in fact, uh, I started exploring more, more stuff. I started uh, doing more shoots, I suppose I start doing more installation kind of work for them. So it really opens up from just purely doing motion graphics, it expanded to installation video works, it expanded to different aspects of, of uh, the usage of video in, in, in different commercial products. Being an MTV uh, is a bit different because uh, there's no real boundary in terms of how things should visually look like. When I was given a brief there, it's really about expressing whether it's a, a show packaging, whether it's a, 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 a sort of like a sponsored program. It's always about finding a very interesting way to show off the, the visuals. So they are not bound to like, oh, you, ca you got to do this, you got to do that. I, I could think of something like uh, some work that I just said, I just want to get a few balloons with alphabets and just put it around the city and just take shots of it. And they were like, okay, cool, just go ahead. And, and it's almost like the tablet just as long as it looks good, you know. In a way, it's, uh, you know, in a way, that, that's very actually liberating for, for a creative to actually explore. So in a way, I'm quite spoiled uh, in a sense, you know. Uh, so I took those sensibility that I have with MTV to sort of apply that on, on my other client work, whether it's projection through uh, on a building or whether it's something that used specifically on a mobile phone. I think that the experience in MTV sort of gave me the idea that, you know, you don't have to rely too much on how small or how big your budget is or what kind of resources you have. You can just break through and get out of the box and just suggest something. So they give me the kind of confidence to tell my client like, let's try this, you know, or let's try that. So I'm not afraid of them telling me like, oh, this sounds a little bit too off, you know. So that the MTV sort of gave me that kind of confidence, yeah. Give me an idea potentially of a scenario when you were there that didn't go very well for you, but you learned a lot from it. Yes, I think uh, on, on many occasions, as, as I mentioned, that uh, when I went into MTV, I have no clue how the broadcast industry works. I'm a graphic designer. I know what an A4 piece of paper is, an A3 piece of the size of A3 or A4, but I doesn't know what the ratio of a TV screen is. So that, when I, when I get MTV, I didn't even understand things like that. But the cool thing about being an MTV, as I mentioned just now, is I, I'm allowed to do whatever I want. So many of the time, for example, uh, when I was rendering something for a piece of work, I didn't really check it, I let it render, I went home, I went for a drink with friends, I come back, and there's a glitch on the screen, there's some type, you know, back in the days where rendering is sort of not very trustworthy. And it has to go on air, like, like right straight away. I would just tell my, uh, uh, well, the, the person who is in charge of you would say, uh, that's a glitch. I would like, no, that's not a glitch. That's my design. It's, it's, part, of, it's part of the work. And I, I just got away with it. And, and that, that, is the, that, that is the cool part of MTV. That's part of my design. So many of the time that, that happens, like I, I come up with ideas that it doesn't work. But the cool thing is, uh, it, it's so flexible in the sense that if I found something that doesn't work, I'll just add on something to it. Like, or maybe it should be something else altogether. And like I said, it's a very, uh, uh, at least during the time I worked there, it's a, it's a very uh, free place where ideas can sort of evolve and change. And when they look at it, they say, well, it still looks cool. Yeah, let's go So you there. had some yeah. happy accidents too, where things happen. I mean, that's part of the creative process too, is kind of getting out of the way and allowing the unexpected to happen, you know, the inspiration, whatever that is. And uh, uh, it's cool that you could be in an environment where you could just kind of let that flow. Yes, yes. I, I mean, obviously, there, there's also like a lot of accidents that I can't prevent. Uh, 
a bit being dyslexic, so uh, I, I get a lot of typos all the time. So yeah, so that's one thing that I can't avoid actually. You do your five years, you're out freelancing. Give us an idea how your path starts to change course. You're dealing with a different kind of clientele now. You're After the, the, the experience with, uh, with, with the channel, uh, when, I, when I get out, I obviously need to sort of uh, very, very consciously to tell myself that I need to somewhat work with different clients to sort of broaden up my, my, uh, my work or my portfolio. So I started uh, sort of exploring uh, uh, working uh, differently. In fact, I started to work uh, backwards, like how I was as a graphic designer, because that's, that's, how, that's what I was trained. So the idea of, uh, uh, of, of following a certain kind of branding or brand guide, or actually uh, answering a very specific brief, uh, that the work is supposed to do something, whether it's to sell something or to inform, it's, it's sort of like going back uh, to what I, I know before. So it takes a while for me to actually get used to that idea of, of having a kind of discipline to really sit down with the client to actually provide a solution for the work that I'm doing. So over the, it probably take me a couple of years to sort of make that switch. Uh, but my experience before, uh, after MTV and my freelancing, well, maybe about 12 years, sort of gave me the kind of uh, confidence I have to, to actually pursue that. And after that, that's why I started the company uh, right after. And tell me about that. Now you've got a lot of experience under your belt. You're ready to open your own shop. Take us through that evolution. I was actually quite comfortable being a freelancer, to be honest. I, I, I like the kind of timing that we have. And in fact, most of the time for one year, I probably worked the first six months. I spent another six months of relaxing, but not like half-half, but sort of in between. So the mostly I just worked for like six months uh, on a couple of projects and I just take my time off in between. But I realized that after freelancing for, for a while, the project that I, I received started to get, uh, at least the size of it, started to get bigger and bigger. So I started to take off, uh, take out as a more creative director role. In fact, something that is, is almost important, like for example, doing a, a branding project for uh, a rebranding of a channel. Uh, it's not something I can do by myself. Obviously, I started to engage uh, uh, freelancers, uh, like 3D freelancers. I started to engage uh, like copywriters and all different people with different disciplines. And I realized that uh, to engage people as a freelancer start to get a little bit troublesome. In a way, it's very hard to control because it's not in the structure of a company. And uh, also, I, after I do works like that, uh, I, people tend to tell us, tell me that, did you actually do that piece of work? I said, yeah, as, as a, in a capacity of a freelancer. But obviously, I, need a, I, I sort of get a help to form a team to work on it for shoots and all that stuff. And people sort of did quite recognize the work that I did. They said, no, you can't be doing it. It's probably done by another company. Because I, I sort of engaged even companies to do shoots, like production house and stuff like that. So I felt that maybe it's time for me to really establish a, 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 a company uh, with a, a proper sort of uh, working structure to actually engage this kind of project. And I seem to enjoy like working in, in that level as well, rather than just doing a one-off uh, promo or one-off uh, video. Uh, I like the idea as I, as I progress to actually work on projects that, that sort of uh, spread out into different aspect of, of the uh, or different sort of execution. So I think uh, that's why I set up a company to do that. Yeah. Bang is actually uh, something that I started uh, in, back in 94 with uh, three of my schoolmates. And, and Fung is basically an art and design group. So even now we were still producing a lot of artworks. Uh, the company I started after MTV, after my freelance, I suppose it's, uh, it's tomorrow. Yeah. These two companies operate simultaneously, correct? Yeah, I think Funk work more like, uh, uh, as I said, it's an art design collective. So a lot of the work we do now in Funk are basically artwork, uh, as in like fine arts, because we are represented by a gallery. Uh, we decided as Funk Studio uh, probably about 15, 15 years ago that we don't really want to go into the doing client servicing. So even though we, we have a, a client work, it's usually a branding work. For example, I think there's a mobile phone company that, that want to work together with Funk. We will produce a sort of a limited edition Funk model. So it's a brand to brand, like brand and, and, and Funk name together as a brand to brand thing. For example, we also have like a, a, a couple of G-Shock watch, like G-Shock and Funk Studio. Uh, so that we really, so we decided that, that that should be what the root funk is, uh, not to be dictated by a brief or, or, or a client. So tomorrow was actually set up to work with clients and, and work on uh, projects that is more uh, commercial based.
What year did you start tomorrow? Tomorrow was started about uh, 2012. I realized that after we pass a certain age, the sense of the way we see time is very different. One week becomes really, really short. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. My understanding of time is after you turn 20, the speed of time doubles. I can't believe how fast things are going. How does that affect you? You know, we're on timelines with clients. We have a certain amount of time to get work done. We have enough time in our lives to have a personal life. Um, and you're a busy guy. You have a lot going on. How have you managed time for yourself? I, I think it's, as you, as you just said, yeah, the, the sense, the way you perceive it is, is different now. Last week, we were just emailing each other, talking about this. And when I receive your email, I, I suppose for me, it's like, oh, this is still a week away. And suddenly we're talking now. And my sense of that, that email to now doesn't, it's, it's so short. You know, it doesn't feel anything like, like it was uh, a week ago. And, and for me, most of the time when I'm doing my work, that, that's how it feels actually. In fact, the last couple of weeks has been really tough for, for, for me and my, uh, my designers because we've been working straight out for seven weeks. I've been doing seven weeks uh, with uh, weekends. And the funny thing is you, you don't start to feel tired, I suppose because you get older, but you don't feel that the time was dragging. You know, when you were, like, you were younger, where if you have to work weekends, it feels like forever. But for me, it's like you just go boom, 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 just like that. And that's worries me because time feels so fast now. So when as a sort of business owner, or, or you start to think about what about the progress of the company. It seems like the time is traveling faster than the progress, what, what the company is progressing. So that's sort of something that always at the back of my mind. See that how can we make the company progress together with the, the, the way I sense time. And also because uh, the way we, I perceive and my, for, for example, younger designers perceive time is different. For them, it's like, oh, wow, it's, this is really dragging. But for me, it's like, no, we, we just have to keep going. So it's, it's a bit strange. It's something I still have to sort of get around with. The one thing that I've noticed my relationship with the concept of time is when I'm doing something that I love, there is no time. Time, there's no passing of anything. Yeah. You know, when I'm in, like you, I'm, I'm imagining what anybody, anybody who's doing creative work, when their head is down and they're just doing it, time is irrelevant. It means nothing. You're, you're in a whole nother space. And we don't even realize time until we start attributing it to this compartmentalization of events, uh, of uh, getting things done or some kind of a schedule. Um, and, and as a creative person, I'm actually really grateful that I can immerse myself into something and eliminate that concept from my life and just be, but that doesn't work in the professional world at all because people have expectations and they're paying for results. And your job, of course, is to balance all that as a, especially as an executive creative director who is, has got a team of people working for them. They've got clients that they have to make happy. You have so many tangibles and intangibles that you are responsible for. How do you manage that? How do you keep yourself in check in a good space, happy, all those things. Every day, I, I sort of have a certain period of time where I, I wake up maybe about six in the morning and uh, maybe towards uh, an hour or two later, I start checking my emails. Basically, try to clear off as many emails as pos I possibly can. And uh, after that, I will start to sort of uh, plan out what am, I what am I gonna do today? And I always sort of have this internal conversation with myself every day. And I ask myself, what am I going to accomplish today? I'm going to do this, 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 and this. So those are the things that I will really, really focus on. And obviously I'll check uh, with my team on if there's any deadline, any milestones that we need to hit. And uh, we'll have a conversation like, uh, how are we actually doing? Are we behind or are we in front? And uh, the rest of the day would be, uh, either I'll, I'll be doing something, or we conversation with the client back and forth, back and forth, and at the same time managing it. So I try to keep everything done by 6.30 or 7 p.m. Because that's when, that's when a lot of time the clients already sort of all went home. And I myself, because I'm married, I have a kid. So I also need to uh, tell myself that okay, I have to stop at some point. You know, I, obviously I, in my 20s, I can just keep going on, it doesn't stop. But I need to be a parent that's present. You know, not just, I just kept on answering emails on my phone. So I've stopped there, just go back to the family. And I uh, always tell my the designer not to work weekend, if possible. 
try your best not to work any weekends. So weekends I try to stay off of, of, of anything and uh, I try to switch off a weekend and try to get back on Monday again. So I think this is more or less, I suppose most people handle the time here. Yeah. It sounds like you have a very nicely well-rounded human experience going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I got nothing to complain about. One thing I, I felt that uh, working in a studio, especially uh, in, in, a sm in a small studio like ours, a good way to actually sort of, sort of devise the time properly is uh, being the most experienced in the team and the second most experienced. I think what we actually do is we actually try to solve the problem beforehand. Because with experience, you kind of, kind of can foresee in a brief that what are the sort of the hinder stone in front of you. The junior designer might not be able to understand the nuances of what the client wants. So we spend a lot of time in front to understand exactly what it is all about. And we try to solve the problem beforehand. And the examples that we give or the versions that we give at the beginning sort of re answer all the problems. And from then on, we can streamline the workflow to allow us to actually complete the project, not in the shortest time as possible, but in the most efficient way as possible. And this allowed the small team like ours to work on multiple projects simultaneously. So there's a lot of strategy in how you align yourself with each project to maximize time, especially because, you know, when you're handling multiple projects, clearly there's timelines for everything. And it's interesting that your job is really to keep everybody happy, including the talent, uh, not just the clients, but you know, to make sure that your talent is operating at uh, full capacity and that they're being creative and they feel nourished and uh, they're getting what they need just as much as the client's getting what they need. Yes, I think keeping them inspired is important because sometimes work can be very draining because you're going to day in, day out work and work. So sometimes we do work on projects that is a little bit different, I suppose. For example, like, a uh, music video we did that like, was released this year but we worked on it last year that is sort of a bit more uh, left view in a sense so to, just to keep their creative juice uh, sort of flow a bit rather than just uh, straight on doing the client project so I think this is a good way to actually keep them a little bit refreshed I suppose yeah, creatively and which yeah. music video was this? it's actually a project we did uh, with uh, our friends in Shanghai uh, uh, they are called 18 Uppercuts basically it's two guys and uh, we actually did for this electronic musician Howie Lee is uh, quite interesting, the music. So uh, the project, we sort of worked together with my friends to actually came up with the direction and idea to actually infuse all the things that we love as a kid, like Hong Kong, uh, zombie, vampire movies from the 80s, Japanese, Ultraman, like Kamen Riders, sort of uh, superhero shows, and maybe even Hong Kong gangster film from the 90s. So all these elements were sort of infused into it to actually produce this MTV. So it's actually quite fun for us to do it too. I think MTV was one of these early collage driven cut and paste over things and like really cool retro feeling graphic design. Somebody else we had talked to recently, we we're talking about Monty Python and that whole collagey looking mm. design element of putting illustration on top of photography and things of that nature. And I know that MTV really blew that out and pretty unbelievable way, especially with motion graphics. I think the reason why I do that back then is because of my limitation in, in After Effects skills and 3D skills. <laughs> so uh, I, as, I, as I mentioned, I, I went into the, the job with, basically I know how to use Photoshop and, and uh, freehand. That's really about it actually. So I try to use those skills that I already have and make it move, I suppose, so that there is a limitation of, of what I can do but I, I always thought that it doesn't really have to... If you can't do those really cool animation stuff, because I'm not from an animation background anyway, you can still make it cool in a, or, or, or visually interesting in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. And obviously you draw a lot of inspiration from, the, from, from what you've seen before as a kid or, or, or that interests you. For example, you mentioned Mon Mon uh, Monty Python and uh, all those ideas that you see. So you sort of draw it back and sort of give a fresh perspective to it. So I, I guess a lot of people does that and I, and I also use that as, as sort of one way to actually uh, express the kind of work that I'm doing. All right, give me an idea of a super challenging project you had, maybe from a creative standpoint or even just dealing with uh, a client that you were not prepared to deal with. What was one of these projects that kind of informed you differently and took you off guard? Oh, wow. Uh, actually, uh, uh, there's a project that I 
I'm, I'm not sure if I can I can reveal the client name. Well, it's, it's, it's a big electronic computer company that I, I work with. The project was simple enough. It was a it, it was a, a, a animation logo uh, for a launch of the one of their shops in Singapore uh, last year. And to me, it was fairly straightforward. It was just a lot of crafting to make the the, the work perfect. But the projects sort of went on for almost like one and a half years. And every time we, we literally sort of work on the project, literally weekly, and it's not like there's a gap in between. And every time we work on a project, there's a little tweak, a little tweak, a little tweak. And that, that was really challenging for me because uh, we try so many options to the point that it, we're running out of ideas. And then we go back again and try something else. And, and I start to think about, is this necessary? But I realized that this is exactly how they work actually. They will, they will exhaust every ways of expression and then they go back to the most simple one. So for me, that, that is the hardest job I've ever worked on so far. It's, 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 it's crazy actually. That, that's the one that actually drives me like, oh, if you ever see the final product, you'll realize that how did you spend one and a half years on this? You, any designer will say, oh, we can do it in like four hours. How did you take that going forward, working with clients in the future? I was lured into the... the as personal, personally, we lure into the project because of, of, the, of the size of the brand, which obviously we want to be associated with. But I, I, I learned from it is uh, we need to, uh, to some extent, draw a line in terms of like uh, how we actually uh, divide our time. And as a company, we also need to really think in terms of the benefits, whether it's, it's the association with the brand or in terms of, of, of sort of like the, uh, the profit margin. Because doing a project like that, even though the budget is not bad, but if you push it to one and a half years, it's, you divide it together, it's, not, it's nothing. It became nothing much. And worst of all, I, I think negotiation of, of how this, uh, this work to be represented is just as important. Uh, despite we did all those work and, and it's a very big brand, one of our contract is not to reveal that we did the work. <laughs> so it's really like we did so much, it's kind of pointless. I think the hard part for uh, a designer sort of uh, converting into a business owner it, it's not really the doing the work or, or the creative part it's actually running the business part which is, is something that I have to learn even now on a day-to-day -day basis because design for me is something uh, that I practice for a while it's almost second nature but it's really running the business that is very different and very tricky how have you kept yourself moving in that way well to be honest I, I'm, I'm still I'm still working it out. I, 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 even as a, I don't think I'm a very, very good business person in that sense because I'm still relying too much as my design side. So uh, it's something I'm still working on. You know, I, I can't tell you that uh, how much experience I gain. I think, uh, like I said, I'm still a learning person in terms of uh, how a business is run. So I'm still, you know, I, I read books. I, I talk to friends with businesses. I, I look at articles and, and hopefully I get, gain some insight to, to actually apply to what I do. That, that's, that's all I'm doing now. So uh, I, I'm not qualified to give any business uh, advice at this point in time. How has the pandemic affected your business specifically? Well, I think specifically when it was, uh, when we heard the, there would be a lockdown in Singapore, uh, last year around April, I think. Like everybody else, I think everybody's panicking. You know, the fact that we don't know what's going to happen. Is the project that we're going to do sort of uh, be cancelled? Or how long this uh, pandemic is going to last? I think at the beginning, everybody was a bit optimistic. They said, okay, maybe by summer or, you know, past summer, everything is just going to die down and everything will be back to normal. But as it progresses, it seems to get worse and worse. And obviously the first couple of months, so everybody's just trying to adjust, trying to work from home and how is it like working from home? Because uh, working in a, in a studio, you're in a, in a sort of in a team. So a lot of the workflow, you can just, something as simple as just walk across the desk and I just tell you that, oh, shall we try this and this? Became a sort of like a task. You know, it's like, oh, we, we go on Zoom call and I try to explain it in my hands and I'm not used to like pointing at your computer, can you see my screen and all those stuff. So it's, it's really a quite a, a, a steep learning curve for me and, and it happens so fast is like, and when this project still sort of ongoing, you still need to sort of jump into it. I think that's one thing, uh, the, 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 the way we work. And the second thing is uh, after a period of time, you start to see the, the, the sort of a, the deep decline of, of projects because uh, even the, the clients and the brands are start holding back. 
to actually observe like how everything is going to sort of fall out. So you, there's a shortage of project during that period of time. So we start, as business owner, we sort of start to uh, sit back and, and, and hope that the thing will turn back quickly. But luckily for us, a lot of our clients are, are sort of based regionally and some are based in China. China recovered back really quickly. And by the time in July, uh, all the projects came back for us. So we start to get really busy uh, uh, during that period. So I, I have to say that uh, we were really lucky between then, uh, July last year until this point, we still managed to keep ourselves quite busy. Uh, it affected us in a way, the way we work, but in terms of businesses, we're, we're, we're still quite all right, actually. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. And do you think because of the fact that everything has gone digital, I mean, we have changed our lives, how we communicate, how we create, but this thing has put everything in a, a really solid perspective that while a lot of industries tanked, some of the, like the content development industry has gained strength, especially in animation and motion graphics where, you know, live action got killed and uh, people still needed to market their products and services. All the big brands still needed to brand to their customers, especially online. Do you think that that metamorphosis through the pandemic actually created more opportunity potentially for someone like yourself to do some really uh, innovative, creative work versus before the pandemic? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a twofold thing. I think the, the pandemic definitely opened up a, a bigger market for uh, motion-based work. Uh, I think I guess even before that, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of the the work that we consume or, or actually watch every day, mostly from mobile phones, uh, whether it's on on a screen on a tablet, very little actually went into print materials. So a lot of graphic designers that uh, students that I met started to go into motion sort of motion based design work, and they they start to uh, a lot of them start to uh, take up courses to learn how to do motion graphics. So in a sense that everything is sort of opened up for them. And motion in graphic design became a sort of a, a discipline that they have to actually engage themselves in. Uh, it's no more just doing just uh, 2D and flat graphics. So in that sense, yes, the pandemic sort of uh, catalyst has speed up this, this process. And suddenly I realized I was, uh, because I'm, I'm hiring uh, this, this last couple of weeks, that there was a surge in demand for motion designers. Everybody's getting a job. So it's very hard for me to look for somebody. So yeah, I can see that happening. The other thing that uh, sort of the, what the pandemic sort of led into is also the way we work. In some way, I'm quite old school. I, I don't like to text. Everything for me is always faster to do a call, but because of the way we work now. So everything is either a Zoom call or we have WhatsApp typing away like, and, and it sort of uh, led me to change the way we actually communicate, like even for clients. You know, they, they'll, they'll WhatsApp you and instead of putting on emails like, okay, this is the changes and this is the stuff. So there's the some WhatsApp you say, okay, they send you images through WhatsApp. I, I find it too fast for my taste actually. Yeah. But somehow yeah. this is the way that the speed has sort of, the speed of the way people work this day. I, I personally think it's quite bad. It's, it's not very healthy because it gets faster and faster. When it goes faster, you get less time to craft your work and the quality of the work tends to go down a bit because uh, it's just too fast, you see. No, I agree. I think the expectation level is out of control. And because of this instant gratification thing that we can do across everything, we're not taking the time to do things well. We're not thinking critically about it. And it's very reactionary. And not the best results typically happen based on reaction. It's based on you know, a proper response. So I see what you're saying. And I've experienced quite a bit of that myself recently where People just want to make changes on the fly and they're not taking a breath in between and it creates a lot of conflict. So I could see how wanting to put the brakes on a little bit and get a handle on it, put some breath back into the time that it takes to really produce some super high-end creative needs to be considered again. Yeah, you're right. I, I think that the reactionary part about it is, is really about, oh, can we just change to this? Can we just change to that? But I think even for a client perspective, it's good to actually for them to actually slow down and think a bit. Does it really work? You know, or, or allow conversation between the shop and, and, the, and the client to actually discuss like back in the days where every presentation there's a meeting and then we would sit down and discuss what is the best solution or best uh, visual direction for it. And, and then with, with thinking, we can actually craft the work better. But with 
texting without actually face to face, you're just reacting to something and say, oh, if it's too dark, then make it brighter. But as you know, we are creative, it doesn't work like this. You know, it's just not a matter of brighter or darker, especially when we work in motion based graphics. You know, it's a timeline, things are connected to something in front and something at the back. So you can't just change something down here and, 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 and just say, oh, just stick something on, you know, and it doesn't work that way. So. So this is uh, the part that I felt that uh, it sort of need to be adjusted to some, to some degree. But we'll probably spin out of control because we're going so fast that we're going to hit a wall. You have to hit a wall at some point and that'll be the qualifier yeah. where we have to kind of reevaluate how we operate and take the time again. At some point, something will force us, just like we've been forced into this through the pandemic. Something else will, I would imagine, come along and make a course correction for us in some way. I hope so. Yeah, I think that would be good for creative, and at least if we actually go into that that sort of direction. I, I think the the way the, the speed that we're working on, I'm sure like a lot of people in the industry will start to see that uh, the budget is still there, but it's cut into instead of a, a big budget for a, a very uh, well crafted piece of work. Even though there's a uh, many applications, they start to cut and dissect into very different small parts because they'll say that oh uh, okay. This is for mobile, so it's, it's not so well produced in some way. Or this is for uh, something else. This is just a banner on a website. So a lot of the work has been comp uh, sort of dissected the budget. So a lot of time, uh, and all this work have different sort of timeline and, and, and planning. And uh, I, I see in terms of a campaign that the, there's a there's lack of continuity, I suppose, or, or unified sort of uh, ideas behind it. So a lot of time these days, if you see a lot of campaigns by even big brands, they seem to be very uh, compactable. Uh, they compact for different sort of market. You know, something is for kids, something is for adults. So they, they sort of zoom in into the, the target audience through uh, the, the kind of social media platform. So, so you don't see a really uh, well taught uh, campaign. I mean, there is, but uh, not as much as it used to be. Yeah. yeah, I think things have become more quantity based for a value proposition than quality based. People want more for their money now. And because of this social media marketing, they want to have these massive blasts of lots of content. But if it's a lot of not good content, it's still not achieving the results that the client really wants. True. I mean, yeah, these days, if you look at your phone or website, it's just a, a slew of, of, of visual overload. So, uh, and every one of us will skip the first uh, five seconds, 15 seconds sort of uh, YouTube pre roll. We, we know that and we are, well, unfortunately, sometimes we're guilty in producing stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, the client is going to ask for what they're going to ask for and we are beholden to the client. We can make recommendations and try and shepherd them through the process in a very high minded way. But uh, everybody has their preconceived notions. For me, I don't really see like client as an adversary, but sometimes I mean, you work with we manage to select and work with some really good clients that we hang on to. So, uh, I mean, if everybody, like, if you guys met some good clients, I think it's, it's good to hang on to where they actually listen. I think the most important thing for them is actually they, they actually take your advice. Obviously, we still need to understand the, the perspective of what they are trying to achieve through what they do. Obviously, they try to sell something or release some information, we still have to achieve that goal for them. But uh, like I said, you know, if you meet a good client, at least, uh, you know, certain part of the creativity that, that you, you sort of uh, uh, input can actually get through, that would be good enough, actually. All right, William, here's the test. You're now, your age that you are now, you're looking back at your younger self. You have all this wealth of information and experiences. What do you tell your younger self who's coming into this business now so they have a little bit of an upper hand on what's coming? What advice are you giving yourself? Well, I think one of the things that I, I, I felt that I learned uh, perhaps a little bit too late is is really to uh, learn to admit your mistake I think that is very very important the, the fact that you can quickly uh, recognize that you make a mistake acknowledge it and rectify it will save you a lot of problem in the end so uh, it might sound very uh, trivial but when you do a piece of work you made a mistake you must tell a client or whoever you work for I made a mistake and I have to quickly try, try my best to resolve that, that problem. For me, that, that's very, very important. I think if uh, a lot of young designers actually understand that, I think they, they will actually grow faster in a sense that 
obviously technique is one thing, you know, experience is one thing, but if you are not able to come to a point to actually understand that I made a mistake and I, I, I recognize it, I think it's very difficult to move on actually. I, I guess the, the idea of losing face is, is quite, especially for young designers, of not acknowledging it, it's quite frustrating at times actually. And I start to imagine that what I was before as a kid, or not a kid in my 20s, that I just said, oh, you know, like what I mentioned about MTV, uh, you know, this is my style, you know, it's, 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 there's no mistake to it. Yeah, so, uh, but luckily I get over, I, I sort of like managed to jump over it, but uh, but I should have just sort of backtracked and told myself, oh, I made a mistake, I should try to make it better, rather than just say, oh, it's, it's supposed to be like that. Yeah. I think it's really down to the person of uh, how they want to work to just turn out. Because I have met a lot of even older designers or younger designers that are quite stubborn because they are creative, so they, they, they tend to be quite stubborn and have a sort of one-track mind and thinking of how things are supposed to turn out. And it could come from anywhere and everywhere. So to be able to actually recognize your mistake is about being flexible at the same time. To tell yourself that, okay, this is not the way to do it, it's wrong, let's try this way. That sort of ex free up your mind in a sense to, to actually ac accept possibilities of different things. That's how I see it actually, yeah. I want to thank you, William, for uh, spending the time on the show. It was great to get to know you a little bit and, and hear about your creative journey and uh, your insights. And we wish you, of course, all the best. Thanks for having me on and uh, take care in, in, in Saigon. If you enjoyed the Pure Now show, you can check out more episodes at balancestudio.tv or anywhere fine podcasts are broadcast. Pure Now is produced and engineered by Hi Ha Dang. Special thanks to our media sponsor, Maybe, and iDesign.vn. Thanks so much for watching.